some form of uh, collage of, of thoughts of Rabbi Sachs on prayer, which will take about half an hour or so. And um, these insights on tefillah on prayer are from a series that Rabbi Sachs did as individual short three or four minute insights, which Dan Sacker, both a member of the Shul as well as the executive director of Rabbi Sachs's office, put together for us as a complete um, composite, if you like, for us to enjoy and appreciate together. And after that, um, Rabbi Paul and myself will be in conversation with one another and anyone else who might want to join us as well um, during the course of the subsequent conversation. Delighted to see my good friend from uh, Florida, Izzy Gable, has joined us once again this evening. Nice to see you, Izzy. Welcome. You're Michelle. Nice to have you with us. And uh, I think without any further ado, I'll hand back to you, Rabbi Portnoy, to put up the presentation from Rabbi Sachs, after which we look forward to our conversation together. Please, God. Prayer is to the human spirit what exercise is to the human body. I try to do my 10,000 steps a day. I don't always succeed, but I feel bad when I don't because I know that with my sedentary lifestyle, if I don't exercise, all sorts of things will go wrong. I'll put on weight. My muscles will grow weak. My blood pressure will rise and my life expectancy will decline. I'll lose years from my life and life from my years. And yes, 10,000 steps on a treadmill can sometimes be pretty boring, but you do it because you know what will happen if you don't. And the same is true of prayer. It's just that we don't have the same kind of precise measurement for the spirit that we do for the body. It's not easy to quantify the feelings of happiness, fulfillment, meaning, gratitude, pleasure, delight, joy, but they make a difference. In fact, they make all the difference to the sense of blessedness of a life well lived. And we now know, thanks to the research of people like Martin Seligman, Ed Dina, Sonia Lyubomirsky and Tal Ben Shachar, that happiness, the flourishing of the human spirit, has a, an effect on life expectancy and on health. It strengthens the immune system. It's correlated with success in education, career and relationships. It turns us outward and makes us less likely to suffer from loneliness and despair. It's just that we seem to have forgotten that prayer is to the spirit what physical exercise is to the body. Meditation, yes, mindfulness, certainly. They're the fashionable things and surely there's nothing wrong with them. Jewish prayer, when it's done the right way, is a form of meditation and mindfulness. But it's also so much more, just as happiness is so much more. It's more than the moment of serenity in a life otherwise punctuated by stress, anxiety and disappointment. Jewish prayer is about gratitude and resilience and forgiveness and love. It's about song and dance and exuberance and joy. Go to a Jewish wedding and you'll know what that means. And sometimes prayer should feel like a Jewish wedding. It's about celebrating life. The spirit needs prayer the way the body needs exercise. And sometimes prayer can be boring the way exercise can be boring, but you do it because you know that it's going to make you feel more energized, focused, revitalized. It's going to make you a better, larger, deeper human being. For the better part of 4,000 years, Jews have been among the world's experts on the human spirit, and much of that has to do with the way we pray. So join me in this series of short videos and let's learn what prayer really is and how it can change your life. Hashem 
שהחזרת את נשמתי, מודה אני על בגד שנחת על גופי, שלא יהיה לי כת השומר עליי. Let me tell you a story about the first prayer we say every morning, מודה אני לפניך, I thank you for giving me back my soul. It happened on our honeymoon. Elaine and I were traveling through Italy, and we'd come to a little coastal town called Paestum, a place with Roman ruins and the sea glittering in the morning sun. The trouble was, I couldn't swim. I just never learned. But as we sat on the beach and looked out across the water, I realized that the shore must be sloping very gently indeed, because people were far out into the sea, and yet the water was only coming up to their knees. It looked safe just to walk out. And so I did. I walked to where I'd seen people standing just a few minutes before, and yes, the water was gently lapping against my knees. Then I turned around and started walking back to the shore. That's when it happened, within a minute. I found myself out of my depth. How it happened, I'm not sure. There must have been a dip in the sand. I'd missed it on my way out, but on my way back, I walked straight into it. I tried to swim, but I failed. I kept going under. I looked around for rescue, but the other bathers were a long way away, too far to reach me, too far even to hear. Besides which, we were in Italy, and as I went under for the fifth time, I remember thinking two thoughts. What a way to begin a honeymoon, and what's the Italian for help? It's difficult to describe the panic I felt. Clearly, someone rescued me, or I wouldn't be here now, but it seemed, at the time, like the end. Evidently, somebody seeing me thrashing about swam over and brought me to the shore. He deposited me almost unconscious at Elaine's feet. I never found out who he was. Somewhere there is someone to whom I owe my life. It changed my life. For years afterward, I would wake in the morning knowing that but for a miracle, I wouldn't be here. Somehow that made everything easier to bear. Every life has its difficult moments, but I never forgot that day on an Italian beach when the life I so nearly lost was given back to me. It's hard to stay depressed when you remember daily that life is a gift, which is why every morning I say with real feeling those words, Moder Anila Fanecha, I thank you, living and everlasting King, for giving me back my soul in mercy. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you, God, for giving me back my life. Think about it. The very first words Jews say every day is modeh. Even before we think, we thank. That's the first rule of prayer. It's about not taking life for granted. It's a meditation on the miracle of being. We are here. We might not have been. Somehow, that makes every day a celebration. I've heard there was a secret chord David played and it pleased the Lord But you don't really care for music, do you? 
goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah. It's said that Eskimos have 50 different words for snow. I'm not sure about that, but this I know that Hebrew has many, many words for praise. La hodot, la halel, le shaber, le fa'er, le romim, la hader, le varech, la ale, or le kales, and others. Because just as Eskimos live in the midst of snow, so to be a Jew is to live in the midst of the praise of God. It's our element, the air, our spirit breathes, the music that the Jewish soul sings. We gave the English language the word hallelujah, praise be to God, and the book of Psalms remains the most beautiful of poetry of praise ever written. Jewish prayer always starts with praise. It takes different forms in different services, but it's always there before anything else. Why? Because on the bad days, we can be distracted by worry, or depressed by anxiety or clouded by fear, we turn in on ourselves as if we were shut in a small, sunless, airless room, unable to see the sunlight or breathe the free air. I'm the last person in the world to minimize the seriousness of depression. Along with Simon and Garfunkel, I know what it is to sing Hello Darkness, my old friend which is why prayer as praise is so important. It says, don't look in, look out. Don't look down, look up. The world is full of light, said the Jewish mystics, if we only know how to open our eyes. The Psalms are a symphony of praise. Listen to this from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens, and the waters above the heavens. Or this from Psalm 150, praise him with the harp and lyre, praise him with timbrel and dance, praise him with the strings and flute. Let all that breathes praise the Lord, hallelujah. These Psalms say, See the glory of creation. Look at the beauty that surrounds you. Listen to the song of a bird. Look carefully at the beauty of a tree, its leaves shimmering in the breeze. Pause and inhale the sheer miracle of being. Remind yourself slowly, gently, I am here. The universe is here. I am alive. I am free. I am capable of love and I am loved. And I will praise the force that made all this and allowed me to be here and see it. Then feel the restlessness subside, the striving cease, the pulse slow, and know for a moment the sheer blessedness of being. All you need for happiness you already have. It's there waiting to be uncovered in the secret places of the soul. Praise is where the journey into happiness begins. Among my favorite lines of poetry are the words of W.H. Auden about the power of the imagination to liberate us from negative emotion. In the desert of the heart, let the healing fountain start. In the prison of his days, teach the free man how to praise. Did my best, it wasn't much Couldn't feel, so I tried to touch I told the truth, I didn't come to fool you And even though it all went wrong Stand before I 
I have a book on my shelves whose title reads, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me, which sums up in one brief sentence what goes wrong so often in our lives. We make mistakes, we all do. In Judaism, we believe that no one ever is or ever was infallible, not Abraham, not Sarah, not Moses, not Miriam. None of the heroes and heroines of the Hebrew Bible are portrayed as saints. We are all human, all too human. And God knew that before he ever made us, which means that he created forgiveness before Homo sapiens ever set foot on earth, but with one condition. It sounds so simple, but it turns out to be one of the things we find hardest of all. Before we can be forgiven, we have to admit, acknowledge that we made mistakes. We can't take refuge in blaming other people, the politicians, the media, our neighbors, or even our enemies. We can't say mistakes were made, but not by me. Because until we accept responsibility for the wrong we did, we can't grow. We can't learn. We can't even really understand why we haven't yet reached our full potential. Look at the best sports people, the real champions, the ones written in the Hall of Fame. Do you think that when they get to be champions, they say mistakes were made, but not by me? No, they do exactly the opposite. They hire coaches. And what they want from their coaches is to watch them practice and perform and then tell them what they did wrong, however small. That's what makes them champions. They want to know their mistakes. They want to understand how and why they made them. They want to learn how to perform better in future. And they do this daily, endlessly. The real champions are the ones who say, mistakes were made by me. Which is what makes Judaism an ongoing seminar in how to be an outstanding human being. God is to us what a coach is to a champion tennis player. He is the one who, when we listen in the deep silence of the soul, tells us what we're doing wrong and how we can put it right. Ovinu Malkenu Shmarkoleinu. Our Father, our King, hear our voice. Ovinu Malkenu Chatanu Lefonecha. Our Father, our King, we have sinned before you. We made mistakes. Help us put them right. Vino Marqueno, Vino Marqueno, oh, Zuveiro, we save him to Stanford psychologist changed our entire understanding of human development in her paradigm shifting book Mindset. What interested her was why some children went on to great achievement and others not. What really fascinated her was the fact that it didn't depend on their abilities. What made the difference was that some children fear failure, so they don't take risks. Whereas others don't have this fear. In fact, they don't even think of failure as failure. They think of it as learning, trying out something new, discovering what works and what doesn't. The children who fear failure have, she said, a fixed mindset. They think that ability is just something you have or don't. So they try not to risk getting things wrong in case it makes them look dumb. Whereas the other children have what she calls a growth mindset. They think of ability as something you develop over time. So they keep learning, working, training, and taking on new challenges. They have resilience. They're not put off by failure. They intuitively know that genius is 99% perspiration and 
1% inspiration. They're like the painter Van Gogh, who kept going despite the fact that he only sold one painting in his lifetime, which wasn't for lack of trying since his brother and greatest supporter, Theo, was an art dealer. Or like J.K. Rowling, whose first Harry Potter book was turned down by the first 12 publishers she sent it to. If you want to achieve anything in life, develop a growth mindset. And Judaism, especially around the High Holy Days, is a sustained tutorial in a growth mindset. How? Because the very essence of Yom Kippur is forgiveness. God forgives our mistakes if we admit they were mistakes, and if we strive to learn from them so that we are not tomorrow what we were yesterday. So there's nothing to fear about failure. God knows we all fail from time to time. He wrote that into the script and provided the antidote. He called it kapara, atonement, forgiveness. It's the Kippur in Yom Kippur. In fact, the whole idea of tshuva, admission, confession, healing the past, coming back to where we're supposed to be, is about personal growth. The heroes of Judaism aren't the ones who were born great. They're the ones who became great by taking risks, surviving trials, overcoming handicaps, staying firm in their sense of purpose and strong in their resilience. That's Moses, that's David, that's Hannah, that's Ruth. And that's us if we take Yom Kippur to heart. God empowers us to dare greatly. And he does so by being in the language of our prayers, Mochel Avonot Amo, he who pardons the iniquities of his people. He is the God who forgives, the God who wants us to grow. Oh, One of the most moving lines of prayer on the High Holy Days is Shema Koleinu, hear our voice, Lord our God. Shema is one of the key words of Judaism, perhaps the key word, and it's almost impossible to translate because it has so many shades of meaning. It means to hear, to listen, to pay attention, to understand, to internalize, and to respond. Judaism is supremely a religion of words. God created the natural universe by words. And God said, let there be, and there was. And we create, or damage, or even destroy the social universe by words. Words are how we communicate our deepest feelings to those we love. And they're also, God forbid, how we wound those that we don't love. Judaism is a religion of holy words. Torah, which is God's word to us, and tefillah, prayer, which is our word to God. And behind the service of Yom Kippur lies an extraordinary historical drama. Here it is. In biblical times, there were holy places. The land of Israel was holy. Holier still was Jerusalem. Within Jerusalem, the holiest site was the temple. And within the temple, there was a supremely sacred place called the Holy of Holies. And there was holy time. There were the festivals. Holier was Shabbat. And holier even than that was the day in the year known as Shabbat Shabbaton, the Sabbath of Sabbaths, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Thirdly, there were holy people. Israel itself was called a Goy Kadosha, holy nation. Within it, the holiest of tribes were the Leviim, the Levites. Holier still were the Kohanim, the priests. And among priests was one holier than all the others, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. And once a year, 
the holiest man entered the holiest place on the holiest day and sought atonement for all Israel. But then the temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was reduced to ruins. There were no more sacrifices, no more high priests. What remained? Just the day itself and us, the Jewish people. And that was when our ancestors discovered that wherever we pray becomes a mikdash ma'at, a minor temple. Every prayer said from the heart is like a sacrifice. And when there is no high priest to bring our prayers to God, God listens to each of us as if we were each the high priest. We no longer had the service of the temple, but we still had the service of the heart. And the knowledge that God listens to every word we say, if it comes from the heart, though we lost all else, we still had the words. Shema Kaleinu, God, hear our voice, have pity and compassion upon us, for we have nothing to give you but our prayers. Well, uh, sorry, can everyone hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. All I can say is, well, importantly, when we first put this together with Dan, we wanted to run a series on Tefillah because we felt during the lockdown we had to find something that would inspire and lift people's spirits when they had to pray by themselves. We never quite thought originally of running this on the first night or the completion of the first day of Slichot. And I'm telling you, I was almost in tears hearing the Mochel Avonis and hearing the Shema Kaleinu that we won't hear that way this year, unfortunately, in our own shuls, so beautifully executed. And the poetry of Rabbi Sachs, I know that Rabbi Portnoy, we're supposed to have a conversation now about Tefillah and picking up on some of these themes. I'd almost vote just simply to rerun that, that presentation by Rabbi Sachs for another hour, half an hour. I'm not going to put it to the vote because I know we wouldn't get a word in edgeways. But uh, thank you. Thank you for putting that together, Dan Sacker and the office of Rabbi Sachs. And thank you, Rabbi Portnoy, for so expertly zooming us in on it and giving us an opportunity to enjoy that. I, I'd like to pick up on three themes and then Rabbi Portnoy, perhaps you'll take it forwards. And if anyone would like to join in, there is a facility. If you go into chat, you can put up your hand. I think it's through chat. You can do it. Rabbi Portnoy will tell us anyway. Um, but finding a way of or into participants, maybe just, yeah, if you go into participants at the bottom of your screen and you press raise hand, then Rabbi Portnoy will be able to see if you've got some contribution that you want to make or not. In the meantime, I'll... Uh, unraise my hand if I can. I can't find a way to do that. Okay, so that's the thing. You go into participants and you can then um, you can then uh, uh, raise your hand and let us know if there's something that you want to share with us. So three things I want to pick up on. Number one, Rabbi Sachs made this fascinating contention. Each of us is a high priest. Now we don't know where we're going to be, never mind by Yom Kippur, but even by Rosh Hashanah. We had that rather sobering news, Erev Shabbat, that uh, garden minyonim, uh, as they've been planned, certainly are not going to be possible. And I know so many, including our own COVID czar, Mark Lewis, and our chair, Johnny Gorboko. I don't know how he's found time to be on here this evening, but it's great to see you, Johnny, with Limor, here on the uh, Zoom this evening. Kolakabog for all you're doing. We may 
we may have to, or some of us certainly may have to face up to the possibility of in Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, more or less alone. How are we going to do that? Well, Rabbi Sachs has given us a key, and Rabbi Porton, I imagine we'll put this up on the, uh, on the Shul YouTube site, and people can use this as a resource between now and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Each of us are high priests. And I want to share with you something that Rabbi Sachs shared with myself as a group of, together with a group of young rabbis, oh, over 30 years ago now, when he first became chief rabbi. And he made the following observation. The mission in Perek tells us, in Perek base, Mishnah Yud Gimel, chapter 2, Mishnah 13. Al tihi rosha bifnei Don't allow yourself to be a Russia. Don't regard yourself as a Russia. As much as we need to have faith in God, we need to know that God has faith in us. And if we're alive and we're here on earth, we serve a purpose, our lives are meaningful, are significant. I think that's point number one that is incredibly important for us to be aware of and not to be scared to examine what we teach, Rabbi Sachs described as those secret places of the soul, liberating us from our negative emotions, to be able to have that sense of strength and that sense of individual connection. I think that's number one. Number two, I'd like to focus on that, which Rabbi Sachs referred to about growth through becoming great. Growth is not something which is just linear and something which is without its interruptions and without its peaks and troughs. But it's that element of becoming, of becoming great. And in the Orchus Chaim Rosh, he says the most beautiful thing. He says to be successful in prayer, Kishiyagia, when the time comes to pray any of the three prayers daily, Yaniach Kolasakov, leave to one side all of the other things which sometimes crowd our lives and screen out the inner truth and quality of soul. For Rosh Kola Gadorim, he says an interesting thing, one thing that's most important, Shayishmeris Einov Mikol Dova Shayinashalai. Guard your eyes from anything which isn't yours. The mission in Perek tells us, don't be jealous of the tables of kings, for your table is greater than theirs and your crown is greater than theirs. How can that be? I've got a home bigger than Buckingham Palace. I've got any crown, a hat anywhere in the house worth more than the, uh, the, the, the crown that the queen wears for the state opening of parliament or whatever it may be. The answer is that for me, and that which I have to become, and my growth centile, and my challenge to realize my potential to become great, I am unique. There's never been another me, never, never will be another me again. Now that doesn't mean I've become arrogant, it means I have to realize that which I can achieve. And finally, I want to say one other thing, particularly this year. There's a verse in Psalms 51.19, which says that, Zivchi lekim ruach nishpara, the offerings of God is a broken spirit. A heart which is broken and contrite, God will not despise. Sometimes we're afraid to take our true emotions into prayer. We're afraid to actually acknowledge our shortcomings as well as to celebrate, as Rabbi Sachs put it, our greatness and our goodness. What we have to learn to do in striking a balance in prayer growth becoming great, knowing that each of us is a high priest, but equally finding the self safe space in prayer to be able to express and to articulate the fact that not necessarily everything is all right in our lives, nor in your life, nor in his life, nor in her life, but that what we're actually aspiring and yearning for is to be on that growth centile, where from the broken heart, the honesty of that we say in Ashri, Hashem is close to all those who call upon him, so long as they call upon him in truth. Don't fake it in prayer. You can be honest. And I know I said three points, but I'm going back to one point I made a couple of nights ago on Zoom about the shofar. It's one of my favorite points. I come back to almost every year that we sound the tekiah, and then we sound in the middle the broken note, the shvarim or the true or the shvarim true together, and then tekiah again. The way to confront our shvarim and our teruahs 
our fears and our brokenheartedness is to start from a position of strength of Takiya, but to make sure that when we've gone into that abyss of exploring our weaknesses and frailties, and I'm sure our appointment can develop this well as a talented psychotherapist as well as, as, well as a great young rabbi, that, that we, after we've explored our weaknesses, Takiya, we've got to put ourselves back together again, and we cannot leave that experience till we're on the Takiya, the unbroken, self-confident, strong note of where we're going to head forwards. So those are just three or four initial insights into prayer, particularly when alone, or particularly when facing difficult times, or particularly when in the midst of a pandemic. Rabbi Portnoy, please, over to you. Thank you, Rabbi Ginsbury. And uh, also, I know Dan's not on here, but a big uh, yashukarach to Dan for getting us access to Rabbi Sachs. Um, so much to say. And um, if I can just start, Rabbi Ginsbury, just um, by noting something that you said, or two of the things you said, and maybe I'll try and get some of my own afterwards. Um, one of the things that always strikes me about particularly Yom Kippur and the Kohen Gadol and the Holy of Holies, the highest point of Yom Kippur, is the tefillah that the Kohen Gadol recites in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And the Gemara tells us something incredibly powerful, and that is the uh, Kohen Gadol would ask Hashem to ignore, if you like, the prayers of those who were traveling. And because they were traveling, they would say to Hashem, you know what, it doesn't really, you know, we don't have, they didn't have uh, planes, cars, they were, when they traveled, it was a long, arduous journey. And they didn't want the rains to fall on them. And it would take weeks or days or months. If we just try and contextualize just how powerful that is, that people who are traveling could pray and ask the Kaddish Baruch Hu to prevent the rains falling, to prevent all of agriculture, to prevent the, the fruits of, of you know, hard-earned farmers and, and sustaining humanity. But their power, the power of their tefillahs was so great that this was one of the things the Kohen Gadol had to ask Hashem himself to ignore. I think that goes a tremendous way in, in demonstrating just how powerful our tefillahs are. Um, of all the things that the Kohen God at the height of, of Ruchnius, of Kedusha, of Holiness, that's what he was praying for, that a particular prayer Hashem should set aside in favor for the greater good of the general uh, good of, of Kali Yisrael and indeed the whole world. Um, listening to Rabbi Sachs, as you said, Rabbi Ginsbury, is just He's, he, every time he's amazing, and I could talk for hours about many of the things he said. Um, what struck me overall were, were I think, two points. Um, if you notice, anyone who was watching all the various clips blend in and out of each other, the power of the music, and uh, I don't know if Dan chose the music or Rabbi Sachs chose the music, but the music did a, not that, you know, Rabbi Sachs is, is uh, every word he speaks is poetry in itself as music, but the, the power of that music between the ver various videos was amazing, was very moving itself. Um, so much so that I, I left the last notes of Shema Kolenu to the end, I didn't want to cut it short. Um, and perhaps one of the things we're all struggling with as we try and get back to Shul at the moment and try and bring back to Shul with us the, the time and the effort, hopefully and the energy that we've invested in trying to uh, work on our own to fill our own prayer it's that power of music. You know, we say so many times in the Pesukah de Zimra, HaBoycha B'Shirei Zimra, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu chooses, uh, if you like, so to speak, Hashem delights in music, in our, in our singing, in Hallel, in so much of what we do as, as a Kehila, um, pre-COVID, was about the Ruach, the atmosphere. And, and in some ways it's easy to, to be elevated and uplifted by tefillah without actually doing too much work if you're in a, a minion where they're singing because the singing lifts people by definition. And so seeing, seeing those clips and hearing that music really hit home to me how challenging times are at the moment because everyone, anyone who, who's on it has been to shul will know that it's very difficult. We, we get through our tefillahs quickly and we can't sing and we can't uh, create a tremendous sense of energy in the room and the, and the ruach, and it's not there. And that's on the one hand. And yet, at the same time, equally, this is our time to really, truly work on to fill up purely without any frills, without any, any of the easy things which come by davening with great song and great uh, emotional uh, uplifting things because of, uh, of the singing. In fact, this year, um, not being able to go to the Coral Slichas, in fact, there was no Coral Slichas, to me was, uh, was very painful because that always 
symbolized the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of, of Yom Naraim, and, and it's always sort of carried me from beginning the whole way through Yom Naraim, the whole, the whole way through Elul. But I think one of the other things that I was thinking was so many of us who are here today, when you hear Rabbi Sachs talk about praising a Kodesh Baruch and thanking and Moide Ani and everyone on here has lost someone dear to them or someone close or, or a great teacher or somebody great to the Jewish community. You know, tremendous Tamil Chachamim, Torah scholars have passed away, tremendous um, people in our families, people who we've loved, who, dear, who are so dear to us. And we've, I'm sure we've all davened and we've all poured our hearts out to our Kodesh Baruch. And one of the great challenges that we have when we daven is that sometimes the response that Kodesh Baruch Hu gives us is not the one we were hoping for. It's, it's, it's almost like our tefillahs fall on deaf ears, so to speak, if we could, you know, think such a thing. And one of the things from Yom Kippur that always moves me, and again, it's at the height of Yom Kippur from the Ila, is that we say a, a beautiful uh, tefillah, um, Ezkara, and in Ezkara, towards the end, we say, that Baruch Hu should take our tears and he should place them in his flask permanently, which is from a verse from Tehillim. In other words, sometimes we cry and we pour our hearts out before our Kodesh Baruch Hu, and we expect, like sometimes young children, who it's purely based on emotion, on an emotional relationship, not necessarily on an intellectual relationship. And it's very difficult when we're going through emotionally challenging times, but we react very emotionally because that's the normal human response. And we should realize and understand that even though HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't grant us that which we are praying for, Hashem is taking those tears and we're asking to take those tears and to put them in a place that in generations to come, perhaps as we say tens of times over Yom Naran, Yes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Malkenu and Rav Soloveitchik and any, read any safer, read any book around this time of year. The whole concept of sechava onesh, of reward and punishment, there's a reality to how we behave, there's a reality to how we act. And at the same time, Hashem is also our vinu, He's also our Father, and it's striking that balance and realizing that generations to come may be the recipients of those to fill us that we daven and pour our hearts out to Hashem Baruch today. The fact that we don't always see the results and the response does not mean that those to fill us are not heard. We should always have the inspiration to know that Hashem is listening and Hashem is uh, in his, you know, had sort of Tom in his total pure sense of justice, uh, carrying out exactly that which needs to to be carried out in this world. Um, and um, just to just to finish, really, um, much more to say, but um, I think that's how we're doing for time. Yeah, um, one of the things I saw over Shabbos was a an idea from the out of Kelm, um, who very much. Uh, emphasized this particular point throughout Elul, which was the whole idea of Rosh Hashanah, as we've come to Rosh Hashanah, is about coronating a Kodesh Baruch Hu. It's about being mamlech a Kodesh Baruch Hu. We say all the verses in Musaf, Chazor Sashatz, to symbolize the fact that we are, um, we are embracing Hashem's uh, rulership, His kingship upon us. And if you think about kingship in a, a modern day scenario, it's about a, a consensus, about a sense of togetherness amongst the subjects of that king. If there's discord, if there's distrust, if there's, there's so much of that distrust and discord and disunity and, and fragmentation today, if you have that, then what is the, the, the king, what does he have? What sense of rulership, of kingship, of power, of, of sovereignty does he have if he has a, a load of totally divided subjects? And we say in davening every day, Yachad kulam hoidu v'himelichu. Yachad kulam, together, all one. Hoidu, we praise v'himelichu. And then we coronate Hashem. It's only through being together, it's only through being united that our acceptance of a Kodesh Baruch Hu's rulership over us is actually worth anything. In fact, we say in, in a few weeks' time, Parashas V'zoi Sebracha, Vayihi b'shur and melech b'hisa'asef roshe om. When does HaKadosh Baruch Hu rule amongst us? Behis Asay, from we are. And Rashi says, Agud Achas, like one unified, uh, unified group, if you like. And Tefillah works in many, many ways. It works as individuals, as Yechidim, but perhaps more powerfully in, than any other way, it works because a Tzibor, a unity, a community comes together and all our merits and all our demerits and all the, all the combined efforts of all of us 
balance out each other and hopefully through our sense of commitment to a greater good, to a tzibur, Hashem will listen to our tefillah. So it's um, my deepest tefillah and hope and prayer that as we approach the Rosh Hashanah, which is, you know, let's not uh, pretend, it's going to be very, very challenging on so many levels. Um, that, that, that which has made us uh, realize that we are all together because, you know, you can be in a different country and sneeze and, and have a tremendous impact on somebody in another country across the, the world, that brings us together and we focus on what unites us and focuses on being part of it, Sibyl, greater hold, and hopefully in that merit, HaKadosh Baruch really will answer our tefillahs. And yeah, we're going to miss the singing, we're going to miss the ruach, but we can work on that. We can have ruach in our homes, we can ensure that our, the children and in, indeed ourselves get into as much of, a, of an atmosphere of, of Rosh Hashanah and Kippah in the ways which we are allowed to and whether, whether it's around the Shabbos table, the Yomtev table, whether it's listening to uh, the music that, that uplifts us and gives us that sense of, of energy. And um, yeah, I, I've well and truly over, over spoken. So um, Rabbi Ginsby, over to you. Are we taking questions? What's the, what's the plan? You, I'm going to pick up on two of the points that you've made, because I think you made them so beautifully and so well. Mm. Just take them a little bit further. One is you talked about this idea of the Kohen Godel and Yom Kippur and the special prayer he, play, he prayed. One of my favorite insights about Yom Kippur is that the Kohen Godel we read in the parish of Achrimos, the way he found atonement was v'chippe ba'adai, he atoned for himself, ba'ad beisai, for his family, and then ba'ad kol kal Yisrael for the entire nation of Israel. Today, in the age of... Um, the internet of social media where so much good can happen look we couldn't be having this even discussion be inspired and lifted by rabbi Sachs unless we had the internet unless we had zoom but you know there was one particular celebrity uh, i'll mention her name i'm not sure someone can necessarily learn from her life had a very sad ending but caroline flack in her last posting said in a world where you can be anything, be kind. Mm. And I think that is something from somebody who was clearly in many ways, sadly, although great celebrity, also a tortured soul. In a world where you can be anything, be kind. To try and look outside of oneself. It's not a journey where you can live as people. One of the saddest things that ever happened to me was there was a celebration band in Manchester. And the lead singer, I won't give his name, I hope he's well and okay these days. But the lead singer, and this was the top Jewish celebration band in Manchester. And for some reason, we became a little bit friendly. His daughter actually became quite a from young lady, and she's one of the closest friends of one of our daughters-in-law now. This chap came off the stage, and he said, Oh, Rabbi Ginsby, it's great to see you. He said, I always feel good when I see you. That's very nice to say, but I only really feel alive when I'm up on that stage. And I said to him, I said, that, I said, oh. I said we're going to make you feel good and alive and well down here in the real world. It's no good just being good and alive up there on the stage. And that is a person whose life and experience and, 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 and buzz, if you like, comes from without. But I'd call Kal Yisrael. Don't start judging yourself by where you are in relation to Kal Yisrael. You can either be a commentator or a spectator, or you can be someone who is actively engaged. Be actively engaged. But to actively engage starts from the Chippe Ba'adoi, who and what we are as people. That's one thing. Rabbi Palmer, just while I'm sharing these few thoughts, we've got about 10 minutes to go. Can I give you a real challenge? I think it'll be a lift for all of us if somehow you can get back into that Rabbi Sachs clip and maybe just conclude with the uh, So one of those lovely tunes, or maybe you can even clever enough pick it up from Google from somewhere else or whatever, etc. But we should finish this on a high with some music to take us out and take us on into these sleekest days. So while our partner is doing that, I want to pick up on one other point. And this is really something which is very personal to me. I was privileged to spend three years studying, three formative years between the ages of 18, or just when I'd finished uh, Hasmir, 18 to 21 when I was married, uh, to study in, in, in the yeshiva in Be'er Yaakov in Israel, where Rabbi Volba was our prime mentor, was our, was our mashkiach.
And he used to say a fascinating thing. He used to say that in, he used to always try and daven mincha at the earliest time. And people asked him, why does he always go for what is known as mincha gadol? You can daven mincha up to sunset. So why take the first opportunity to daven mincha? And people would say sometimes, you know, maybe it's to get it out of the way. Maybe it's to make sure I don't forget. And Revolva used to say, I daven mincha at the earliest time because I find my spiritual energy levels, we might describe it, are beginning to drop from shachris. I put a lot of effort in shachris, I'm beginning to drop. So I need that booster of mincha and I need it sooner rather than later. That's an incredible idea that you don't pray to discharge a responsibility. You don't pray because you're scared you might otherwise forget to pray. You pray because like I breathe. Do anybody ever said, I'm going to eat lunch because otherwise I'm scared I might not eat my midday meal? You eat lunch because you're hungry or there's something nice in front of you or you need a break, whatever it may be. In prayer, we have to look at it exactly the same way. We have to almost, if I may use a sort of Yiddish Hebrewism here, chalosh. You've got to be like absolutely almost salivating for the next fill of the next prayer. And this is where I want to come on to a very beautiful story about Moda Ani Lefanecha. And this is the other point Rabbi Portnoy made about through thanksgiving, being able to get into that mode of, of, of prayer and connection with the divine. The first night I spent in yeshiva was really quite interesting. I turned up there, the big kanaka, I was head boy in Hasmonea, I'd finished school, I'd done my A-levels, and I arrived there in yeshiva, no one's heard of me. It's been four days of internet, mobile phones. I've got a little piece of paper in my hand saying I've been accepted to the yeshiva. No, that doesn't mean anything. That's just for the authorities. When you come in, you've got to have a desk and watch yeshiva. No, we haven't got a bed for you. It's about 11 o'clock night, and, and, and night by now. One or two boys from England come, give me a shomalech and go on their merry way, trying to help me sort out a little bit. So they tell me in the end, they tell me, you know what? Nissim Cohen isn't here tonight. Go and sleep in Nissim Cohen's bed. Do you know what it's like for an English boy at 18 to go and sleep in some unknown fellow's bed? So very gingerly, I don't want to take off his bedclothes, but I'm blowed if I'm going to sleep in his bedclothes. So I sort of roll up my sleeping bag, very unhappily sort of go to bed. I wake up in the next morning and the bed opposite me, all the rooms in the have three beds. A boy sits up, he's got lovely pears, a big bean face. And he sits up with this big smile. Muy de ani lufunejo. You've never heard the Moda Ani like it. I thought I landed on planet Zog or ended up somewhere, I don't know, on, on the moon or on Mars or whatever, etc. Who was this boy? This boy's name was Ben Sina Cohen Cook. He later became the right hand man of Rebel Yashiv and today is one of the aspiring greats. He was my Chavrusa for two years in Yeshiva. I ended up in Raleigh really Close, and he's become one of the great rabbis in Israel today, famous across Israel, Rabbi Rensina Cohen Cook. We meet up from time to time still. His story was tragic. At the age of 12, his parents, who were absolute stars in Israel, in Rechovot, where his father was Rosh Shiva, they were traveling home on the Erev Shabbos. They had the most terrible road traffic accident at a level crossing on the Israeli railways, which was unfortunately something that happens all too often in those days. And both his parents and two siblings were killed in that accident. That's before Ben Sian was by mitzvah, he was 12. I heard stories that when he was still in school and he could bear it he used to go into a little room somewhere and he would start crying and say sing the song Lule were not for your Torah which is my plaything I would have been lost in my impoverished status in my poverty this boy was a giant of the spirit destined for greatness which he's really reaching for now and this was a fellow who said a maida ani like I've never ever heard before or since in my life. This is the fellow, an orphan from both parents. He was 17, 17, 18 years old at the time. And I learned one lesson from that. There's never an excuse for anybody upon awakening in the morning not to thank God. And that is our challenge. Moida Ani, and our partner described for us beautifully how you can move from Moida Ani to every good thing in terms of your relationship with God and realizing and envisioning and achieving your purpose in life. So Moida Ani, the idea of 
reaching out for the earliest opportunity for prayer, not to get it out of the way, not because you might forget it, but because you can't wait to be able to pray. Each of us as a priest and growth for becoming great. Those are my four takeaways from this evening, which will help me, I know, in my last days now before Rosh Hashanah and through our social media, Chuba Inti and Kippur as well. And I'm convinced that somehow or another, we are going to, through this and through so much other programming and good that has come out of the awful nature of the pandemic, we're going to find a deeper and stronger sense of rootedness in our connection with the divine, in our connection with one another. And even from these dark and difficult times, we're going to take a source of bracha and inspiration to even better and happier lives than we've ever known before as we build our future together.
concludes tonight's program. We could leave it on for hours, but I think everyone has things to do. So uh, thank you for joining. Remember, to, uh, Tuesday night, um, I'm giving a shirt on to Shiva from a uh, psychotherapeutic and rabbinic perspective. I think it's at eight o'clock. I have to check. We'll put a note on the WhatsApp group. Thank you, Rabbi Ginsbury, and thank you, Dan, and thank you, Rabbi Sachs, and thank you all for joining. Have a good night. Thank you, Rabbi Portnoy. Good evening. Good evening, everybody.